If you are new here, we welcome you. My name is Pastor Rick. I'm the executive pastor here. And uh, man, today is Palm Sunday. We are celebrating, man, Holy Week here. We love Jesus and we love everything about him. And so today, traditionally, uh, through the Bible, he would have been riding into Jerusalem on a donkey uh, through the streets. And the reason why they call it Palm Sunday is because they were waving palm branches and they were throwing them down on the ground as he came by. So we're going to read about it today. Uh, Turn with me to Matthew 21. Uh, Matthew 21, we're going to read verse 1 through 11. uh, And I'm reading from the ESV version today. And so it says this in verse 1 now, when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethpage to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go into the village in front of you and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say the Lord needs them and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. Verse 6. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he had entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up, saying, Who is this? And the crowd said, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. If you guys are taking notes today, uh, this afternoon, the title of this message is Don't Miss It. Don't Miss It. Come on, let's pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you, God, for what you've already been doing today. Lord, you are moving. You are moving. You are moving amongst us, God. And so, Lord, I just pray that you would encounter us in such a way that we would leave here changed, that we wouldn't just show up to hear a few words and sing a few songs, but that we would be totally changed and reformed. So, Jesus, I need you right now, God. Lord, speak to us, Lord. Let your words be my words and your thoughts be my thoughts. Come on, in Jesus' mighty name we pray. And everybody said amen. Amen. Well, have you guys ever been sent to find something and you couldn't find it? Am I the only one in here who's done that before? You know, you go and you're like, man, you look everywhere and you're flipping stuff over and you're, you're tearing the house apart and, and you're, you know, you're looking on the shelf and you're like, I know it's here. I was just right here. I just saw it yesterday, right? Your wife or, or you know, you're, you're, for the men in the room, your wife is like saying, it is right there. I know it is. And so I want to pick on the men a little bit in this room. And so men, we have a syndrome. And the syndrome is very real, okay? It affects 10 out of 10 men in this room. 100% of the guys in here deal with this thing. It is the syndrome known as the I can't find it syndrome. Any man in here can identify with the I can't find it syndrome, right? Where we go in search of the thing for which we are sent, right? Only to find ourselves telling ourselves I can't find it. It was right here. I'm just not seeing it. Where is it at? I know it's right in front of us. And the only antidote that I have found for this syndrome is the woman who is the helper that is suitable for us to come right behind us and say it's right there, right in front of your face. And I'm convinced that my wife has it in her hand as she's walking up and she sneaks it around and says, it's right here. I told you it was right there. It was right in front of you. How could I miss it, right? And women, you're not off the hook either. And some of the men say amen, right? Your I can't find it syndrome comes in the form of a missing phone. Any women in here cannot find your phone. (laughs) Preach, right? And you go around the house and you ask everybody, where's my phone, right? Have you seen it? You know, I know it was here. It was here right before. And all of a sudden you pull it out of your back pocket and it was there the whole time, the entire time. (laughs) But we do this all the time, right? Our perspective of what we think is going on and what we see is off. And have you ever been in a situation where you rock up to something and what you're looking at, you interpret totally different than what it, what's going on? Well, in 2018, uh, when we moved into this building, uh, I was at, we were out in the parking lot, my wife and I, and we were having, let's say, a very animated conversation, okay? 
Well, let me just say, I was very animated in our conversation, and she was just listening. And so when I talk, I use my hands a lot. I I don't know if you noticed that, uh, but I like my hand to hit you before the word does, you know, so don't stand too close to me when I talk to you. And so all of a sudden I look to the left and there's two members of our church and they're driving by really slow and they have this look of terror on their face. And I know what they're thinking. They're thinking, oh my God, Pastor Rick and Lacey are fighting in the parking lot right before service. Anybody ever do that? Come on, nobody in this room has ever done that right before they walk through these doors. But we weren't fighting, I promise. We were just having a very animated conversation. I was very passionate about what I was telling my wife. And she's just going like this, you know, and stuff like that. But it wasn't what they thought. And we do it all the time. Our perspective of what we think is going on, it's off. It's not what really is. And can I just say that there's a lot of Christians running around with the gift of assumption and not the gift of discernment. That we assume so much and we call it discernment. There's not a demon hiding behind every single rock in your yard, okay? Your gift of assumption is not the gift of discernment. And we wanna make assumptions based on what we think we see or perceive to be true, when in reality we completely miss it. We completely miss the mark, right? Where we tend to interpret spiritual things with the natural sense, right? With the physical sense. You and I have a lens at which we view life through called a paradigm. What is a paradigm, Pastor Rick? That's a pretty big word. A paradigm is a standard perspective or set of ideas that is shaped by what? Our upbringing. It is shaped by your beliefs. It is shaped by your culture. Uh, A paradigm is a way of looking at something. It's a lens at which we view life through. And so paradigms, they're made up of three parts. The first part is this, ontology. Ontology asks the question, what is true? Okay, it is the, the, uh, it is the study of your being in general, of what or, or what applies natural, neutrally to everything that is real. It's made up of epistemology, which asks the question, how do we know? It distinguishes justified belief from opinion. It's made up of ethics, which asks the question, what is good? Right, it's the moral principle that govern a person's behavior uh, or the conducting of an activity. And so every time you view something, right now you guys are viewing me through this paradigm or this lens. And you guys are asking these questions subconsciously in your mind. What is true? How do I know? And is it good? Is what Pastor Rick's saying right now, is it good? Does it line up with my moral principles? And too often... Uh, right, our, 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 the problem is that our paradigm or our filter is broken. Okay, can I just say that, that it is, is broken? Why? Because it's shaped by your circumstances. It is shaped by your upbringing. It is shaped by the past hurts and things that you have been through, uh, right? And, and, and when you have a broken lens or when you have a broken filter, uh, which you look through, uh, you're not going to quite see clearly, right? Your vision is going to be skewed. It is going to be cloudy. And it's important that you and I have a paradigm that is shaped by the culture of Christ. We need to have a vision that is shaped by the Word of God and the things of God. You and I need to look through the lens of Jesus Christ, right? That, that, that we are constantly looking to Jesus through this lens, right? Who is the author and the perfecter of our faith. This is why Romans 12, 2 tells us to renew our mind, to transform it, right? To, 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 to take what we think we know and transform it with Jesus. You see, there's a paradigm that Jesus wants to give you. It is a kingdom paradigm. It is a spiritual paradigm. You and I need spiritual vision to see the vision of this new building come into fruition. We need spiritual vision to look at that $6 million number and say that is a small number because we have kingdom perspective. I know my daddy owns the cattle on a thousand hills and there is nothing impossible with him that if he orders it, he's going to pay for it. He really is. And you and I get the privilege of being a part of seeing that destiny come to fruition. Isn't that awesome that it's a privilege that we get to see God use use us and work in this city for for such a time as this? And can I just say this morning or this afternoon that God wants to fix your broken lens, that he wants to give you a clear vision, that he he wants to give you a clear understanding of not only who he is, 
but what he's about to do in your life, for your marriage, for your business, for your finances, for your children, but not for their children, not for those children, but for their children's children. And too often we look to Jesus in the wrong ways and we end up missing what God is trying to show us in the process. We really do. You see, as disciples, we need spiritual vision. We need kingdom vision and not physical. And see, this road to Bethany, as Jesus was on the back of this donkey coming into Jerusalem, the road was full of people. And it was also full of people that were following him from town to town. In fact, it was full of spectators. Look at John, uh, John's account in John 12, verse 17. It says this. It says, The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they heard he had done these signs. You see, these spectators were on the road not because of Jesus himself, but because of the signs of which he'd done. They were paying more attention to the miraculous than they were to Jesus. Let me just say this. Don't be a spectator and stand in awe because of the miracles of Jesus. Stand in awe because of the miracle worker himself. That we have a tendency to focus on the miraculous and we completely miss the miracle worker himself. Do you want the miracle or do you want the miracle worker? Come on, his name is Jesus. And too often we're seeking healing, we're seeking breakthrough, we're seeking these manifestations, and we completely miss Jesus himself, right? We focus on his hand and not his heart. We focus on what he can give us and not his face. And I wanna encourage you, do not miss Jesus because you're too busy looking for your miracle. We have Christians, we call them gypsy Christians that go from church to church to city to city and they never put any roots down because they're chasing after the manifestations of Christ. But they wonder why their life is still in shambles. It's Jesus that's gonna fix that. It's not the manifestation. He tells us, in, uh, uh, he tells us to seek his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. We need a paradigm shift from his hand to his face. We need to seek Jesus in that process. And so these same people that were on the road, they were also shouting Hosanna. They were also shouting the King of Israel, right? They were laying down their cloaks. They were laying down palm branches and it was just celebration and everybody was happy and they thought they knew what Jesus was there to do. They thought that Jesus was coming to overthrow a Roman government, a Roman empire, and they thought he was gonna reestablish the kingdom back to Israel. That's what their lens was. But he didn't come riding on a conquering horse. He didn't come riding in as a conquering warrior with his army and his men behind him, no, no, you know, ready to overthrow this empire and set up a physical kingdom. You know, the triumphal entry wasn't very triumphal at all. It was, in fact, it was a very anticlimactic event for the people because what they thought Jesus was there to do, he wasn't there to do that. And in the end, it, it ended up with him dying on a cross. It was very anticlimactic, but he came in on a donkey, which symbolized peace, that he wasn't there to overthrow the Roman government. He was there to overthrow the kingdom of darkness. And he rode in on peace. And he rode in as a peaceful warrior. They completely missed the reason why Jesus was there. They didn't see it. They didn't see it, they missed it. They were viewing him through the broken lens of oppression from the Roman Empire. Can I just say that God wants to fix our lens today? And that's my question for you is what lens are you viewing Jesus through? Are you viewing him through a broken filter? Are you viewing him through a lens of bitterness, through a lens of hurt, through a lens of offense? Are you viewing him through a lens of, man, I got hurt by that one man and I will never trust another man again. My filter's broken, man. That woman, she, she, man, she really messed my heart up. I will never trust another woman again. And so we go from relationship to relationship, right, from people to people, and we view them through this broken filter. Maybe your filter of the Father is broken because of your relationship with your earthly father. And because you didn't have a good relationship with your dad, you and your heavenly father don't have a very good relationship. Why? Because I'm viewing him through that same lens of oppression and brokenness that I came through when I was 
young. Can I just say that Jesus wants to break those mindsets off of you today? He wants to break them off of you today. He wants to completely set you free from all of that pain and all of that bondage and all of the stuff that you went through that caused you to have a broken filter. You see, when Lacey and I got married, it was like two completely opposite worlds colliding. It was crazy. And I, I pray for all of you that are in your first year of marriage right now. Good Lord, was that first year of marriage hard. I'm telling you, man, it was rough. And if you're in your first year of marriage, I want to encourage you to keep going. Keep going because it gets better. It gets a whole lot better. I'm telling you, it's getting a whole lot better. But we had two worlds collide, right? And, you know, I came from a poverty, you know, food stamp stricken life. And she came from a very affluent home. And so we had some pretty different mindsets when it came to things, right? I was a hoarder and a saver. And she was this generous person who liked to just give it all away. In fact, she still does that today. And, and, and she's actually taught me a lot about generosity. And, you know, we had some different views on money and how to spend money. We still have some very different views on money and how to spend money. For instance, <laughs> she went shopping yesterday, bless her heart, right? She comes home and, you know, you know, Sam's Club and all the stuff. And then she has this box from Victoria's Secret. It was some, some new perfume that they had. And I said, oh, that's, that's awesome. How did you pay for that? You know, because I'm the keeper of all budgets in the house, you know, and all that. Oh, yeah, how did you pay for that? She goes, well, I had my birthday money. Oh, your birthday money. Yeah, the, you know, the money I got for my birthday. Oh, the money that you're supposed to put together with our money and, you know, keep it in the drawer for different things. Oh, yeah, no, no, that's my birthday money. And then like two, maybe a minute later, she goes, oh, and by the way, I forgot to use my birthday money when I bought that. I used the credit card. I used my birthday money for something else. And I'm like, you can't do that. That is not how this works. And she goes, yeah, she goes, yes, it is. That is how this works. Right? We had some very different views. And so we had to meld those views together. But as we allow Jesus and the truth of God's word to reshape our paradigms, to reshape our love and to reshape how we come together, he started to break down those walls and he started to show us an image of what our relationship was about and the purpose for not only each other and for our lives. Come on, can I just say that God wants to break down those walls. He wants to break down those paradigms in your life that you have allowed to be there since you were little. He wants to see, he wants, he wants to break those free so you can see clearly. And so the triumphal entry, even though it was very anticlimactic, it was the most profound moment in history. It really was. And it was taking place right before their eyes, but they missed it. You see, on one hand, Jesus was literally fulfilling a prophecy that was spoken 500 years before this day. Imagine that. We're not even 500 years old as a nation. And there's a prophecy spoken by the prophet Zechariah about this very thing happening. And 500 years later, here it is happening right in front of their eyes. We see that in Zechariah 9.9. It says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he. But he's humble. He's mounted on a donkey on a colt, the foal of a donkey. So on one hand, he's fulfilling prophecy to a T, and on the other hand, he's fulfilling the requirements of the law for a perfect sacrificial lamb to be slaughtered at Passover. Check this out. This is going to blow your mind. He acted out the very process God laid out in the books of, book of Exodus for Passover. And we know that Passover was only four days away which made the day of the triumphal entry the 10th day of that month. And Sandy, I can't remember the, the month. It was Abib, but the month, I can't remember the month. Why is that significant? Well, we see the significance in Exodus chapter 12, verse 3 and 5, 5 and 6. Listen to this. He tells Israel concerning the Passover. Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the 10th day of this month, which was the day he rode into Jerusalem, Every man shall take a lamb according to their father's houses, a lamb for a household. Your lamb shall be without blemish. It shall be a male a year old. You may take it from the sheep and from the goats. In other words, take it from amongst the, the, the sheep. 
and you shall keep it until the 14th day of the month, pretty significant, when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. Why is that important? You see, as Jesus was riding into Jerusalem and the people were shouting out Hosanna in the highest, unbeknownst to them that they were literally selecting the Paschal lamb to be sacrificed at Passover. What is a Paschal lamb? A Paschal lamb is simply the lamb that was selected for the people to be sacrificed at Passover. That's what it is. And see, John tells us in John 129, John the Baptist prophetically declared, Behold, Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. In Revelation 5.12, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power, riches, wisdom, strength, honor, and glory. You see, Jesus would have been sacrificed four days later, which was what? In Exodus, the 14th day of the month, right? Which would have been twilight on Thursday of that week, which in the Jewish week is actually the next day, which is Friday. Which on the timeline of events, Jesus would have been being crucified the exact same moment as the other Paschal lambs in the temple were being crucified. Am I the only one that thinks that's awesome? I think that is, that is amazing. It's, it blows my mind. How this, how this thing played out like it did. And it did, not, it did not veer away from the law that on the 10th day of the month, Israel selected Jesus to be sacrificed. And on the 14th day of the month, he was sacrificed alongside of other Paschal lambs that were being sacrificed. You cannot make this stuff up, you guys. It is real. This is real. This is real. So they completely missed what he was there to do. And the same people who were shouting, Hosanna, son of David, have mercy on us, the kingdom of, all those same people just four days later were shouting, crucify. Their hearts changed. They didn't have a good paradigm. Don't be a disciple that praises him around other people, but denies him when you're alone. Don't be that disciple that comes in this room and shouts glory unto God and praises him and high-fiving and amening and all those other things. But when we go out into the world, we are silent. When we go out into the world, we keep our mouths shut. Don't be that disciple. Don't be that person. If I can have the keys up, that'd be awesome. You see, the road from Bethany to Jerusalem was about a two-mile journey, and this road would have been full of pilgrims, all coming back to Jerusalem with their families, Paschal lambs, on their shoulders, on wagons, on, you know, donkeys, and they were along this road. But the road was also full of, of, of Jesus' followers, all the people who had followed him from city to city, seeing the miracles that he'd done. And in Mark's account, in, in verse 9, in chapter 11, it says, And those who went before... And those who followed were shouting again, Hosanna, blessed is he coming in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father, David, Hosanna in the highest. And so those same disciples who were singing and praising were shouting, crucify. In fact, his very own, the apostle Peter would deny him three times in the process. You see, many were on the road, probably hundreds, but only three stood by him at the cross. Isn't that a sad thing? And all these people were shouting. They were so excited. But when push came to shove, only three stood by him at the cross. And one, was, and one was his mother. And one was another woman named Mary Magdalene. And John. Don't be a disciple who praises him around other people but keeps our mouth shut when push comes to shove. You have a boldness inside of you. Even though we are like sheep, we have a lion's roar on the inside of us. That there is a lion of the tribe of Judah who lives and he dwells inside of our hearts. Don't allow yourself to be silenced by fear, by temptation. Don't allow yourself to be silenced by intimidation. You have a, vows, a mouth and a voice. It's funny, well it's not funny, but on Friday, my, my daughters brought this paper home that their school gave them. And see, they're in CMAS testing right now, and I, I don't even know what CMAS is, but some sort of testing. And it caught my attention because on the paper it said, you have been selected to be a part of Namaqua's School of Witchcraft and Wizardry. And I go, 
got so angry. I said, what is this? Oh, it's just a little Harry Potter, Pastor Rick. No, it's not just a little Harry Potter. There's no such thing as just a little bit of witchcraft. Witchcraft is witchcraft. In fact, I want to break off witchcraft right now in Jesus' name. Come on, right now in the mighty name of Jesus. I don't know who that is, but I break that off of your life. We break the curse of witchcraft in the mighty name of Jesus. We plead the blood of Jesus. We know who you are. We're not afraid of who you are. Your powers are futile. And so, Lord, we bind and we rebuke now any and all forms of witchcraft and wizardry right now in the name of Jesus. It's not just a little witchcraft. It is demonic. It is the devil. And so, God, we plead the blood of Jesus Christ over our children. Thank you, Lord. And so what am I going to do? <laughs> I'm calling that school tomorrow, and I'm going to let my voice be heard. That even though it's just a little bit, it's just a little bit of Harry Potter. No, the enemy is sneaky, man. And he's coming in through ways that are disguised as good, but yet they are evil. We need to watch out for our babies, you guys. I don't know if you came to CIT the other day, but that's just the tip of the iceberg of what the enemy is trying to do to go after our kids. Jesus says in Matthew 10, 33, he says, so everyone who acknowledges me before men, I will also acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. You see, the way you view him in private will be the way you shout him in public. How's your private relationship with Jesus? When people look at you, can they tell that, they've been, that you've been with Jesus? I hope so. I'm telling you, sometimes we're stone-faced. We're walking around, we don't look happy. I'm a bigger proponent of that, man. I got this, this, this face sometimes, and people are like, are you okay? And I'm like, I'm great. <laughs> really, because your face is saying otherwise, like, like Dr. Matt said last week. Church, this Easter, I want to encourage you guys, don't miss it. Let's not miss it. Let's not miss the reason for the season. Let's not miss what this season is all about. It is not about an Easter bunny and Easter eggs. It is about the king above all kings. And the same Jesus who rode into Jerusalem on a donkey is the same Jesus who will one day return on a conquering white horse. That it says that he has a name written on his thigh, King of kings and Lord of lords. The Bible says that he has eyes like a flame of fire, that he is the beginning and the end, that he has a sharp sword that comes out of his mouth. It says that he judges and he makes war, that he created all things through him, by him, and for him. It says that he is the alpha and he is the omega, that he is the beginning and he is the end, that he is the first and he is the last. And it says that one day every single knee will bow and every single tongue will confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Whether you like it or not, one day you will bow to the name of Jesus Christ. That is the Jesus that rode into Jerusalem on that day. We serve a risen Savior, one who went to the cross and he paid the price for you and for me, not so that we can just gather together on a Sunday and sing some songs and listen to a, a word and then go home and, and be terrified by the world. You have the power within you. You have it inside of you. We're to shout it from the rooftops, you guys. Don't miss him, church. Don't get swallowed up in everything that Easter's not and completely miss the Messiah, the King of Israel the king of this world, your king, my king. The Bible says that those who believe in him shall not be put to shame. That he became a curse so that we would not have to be cursed. And so as I wrap this up, you and I need to be a disciple who not only has our faith and trust in the right person, but have it for the right reasons. And in Matthew's account, chapter 21, verse 9, it says, And the crowds that went before him again and followed him were shouting, Hosanna, son of David, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. You see, in this moment, they weren't shouting because they were giving praise to Jesus. They were shouting this literally to say, Save us now, son of David. In other words, save us from this Roman establishment. 
Save us from the oppression of the Roman Empire. King of David, save us. In fact, the word Hosanna is actually an Aramaic word that is translated literally to help or save. And it was only later translated as a form of praise out of someone's mouth. You see, the people on the road were quite literally saying, save us, Jesus. Save us now. Save us now. You see, the people on the road, they they had their faith in the right person, but it was for the wrong reasons. You know, there was a a prison I was in down in uh, Colorado Springs. And when I got sent to this prison, there was a church that I had actually just walked right into. And I had a a guy that was running it. He said, man, you're here for this church. You're going to run the church. And I said, okay. And I stepped into it and we ran the church. And man, we grew the church in this prison. We had revival. There was hundreds of men coming to the faith. I mean, we had worship services that were so powerful. Prison guards from all over the prison were coming to our service just to be in the presence of God. It was incredible and it was awesome. And man, I was, I was, I was living my best life, if you could, behind bars. And I thought, man, I got, I got the parole board hearing coming up here in a little bit, man. And I know, God, man, I've been, I've been building your church, Lord. Yep, God, you got me in here. We're growing. There's people getting saved. I know you're going to let me out, God. This is it. This is my moment. You're going to just release me, and I'm going to go into my destiny, and it's all good. God, look what I've been doing for you, Jesus. Surely you're going to let me out of prison. And I went in front of that parole board, and they stamped a big denied. Oh, God, I was devastated. Man, I was devastated. I got bitter. I got angry at God. I got frustrated. I handed the church off to another guy. I applied to get out of that prison and I went to another prison and I was just so broken. And God had to restore me through some crazy, crazy scenarios and situations that I never would have thought coming. You see, I had my faith in the right person, but it was for the wrong reasons. I was doing things because I thought I could manipulate God, if that makes sense. Oh, God, surely you're going to let me out what I want. He said, I got other plans for you, son. See, there's some things inside of you that I need to get out. There's some stuff that's within you. And I'm speaking to somebody right now. The trial and the tribulation you are going through right now in your life, you've been praying for God to remove it. You've been praying for God to get it out of there. You've been praying for God to deliver you. But he's saying, I have allowed that to happen to you in your life so I can shape and mold you into the image of my son. That there's some things on the inside of you that I need to get out. There's some things that you cannot take into this next season. And unless this trial goes before you, they will not come out. And so, Lord, I pray for that person right now in Jesus' name. God, that you would give them endurance, Father, to withstand the trial and the tribulation. That you would give them endurance, Father God, to get through. And that they would boldly even say that even as David said, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Because you are with me. Can we be a people not afraid to praise him when we're alone? Can we be a people not to use Jesus for his hand and love him for his face? Can we be a people who come to Christ for the right reasons, who have our faith and trust in him simply because we are thankful and grateful that he saved us, not so that we can get his stuff, not so that we can get his things, but so that we can gain him in the process. And that's all God wants. He wants you to gain him. He doesn't want you to gain his things, even though that's part of the deal. Let's pray. Close your eyes. I just want to ask you some questions. So where are you guys at? (laughs) Here we are, 2023. It's Palm Sunday. Here in just a week. Here in in a few days, we're going to have a Good Friday service. And we're going to have an Easter service. Who are those people in your world that you need to invite? I just pray right now with your eyes closed. I pray that the Holy Spirit starts to just reveal some stuff to you. Lord, that you would bring it before our eyes right now. What is it? What do we need to lay down? What do we need to confess? What do we need to repent? Maybe there's there's none of that. Maybe we just need to rejoice for what you've done for us, God. I just pray that you do it now, right now, in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Thank you, Father.
You may be in this room and maybe you've walked away from Jesus or maybe you don't even know who Jesus Christ is. You got invited by a friend or you just stumbled through the doors. Can I just say that Jesus is after your heart? He's been after you your whole life and that there's room for you in the kingdom. You see, he became a curse for you so that you wouldn't be cursed. And he took your shame, he took your punishment, he took the penalty for the sins that you commit and he nailed it to the cross. And the Bible says that, man, if you believe in him, if you believe in him, if you, if you confess him as Lord and if, if you believe that God rose him from the dead, it says that you will be saved, that you will be grafted into the heavenly family, that you will become a son and daughter of the most high God. But there's a repentance that has to take place in your heart that you need to see with inside yourself that, man, I know I need a Savior. The life that I've been living isn't a good life. And I know that I need to turn from these ways and I need to turn towards faith in Christ. And today's your moment. If there's anybody in here, I want you to slip your hand up right now. I got one right here. Thank you, ma'am. Come on. Would anybody else in here say, yes, Pastor Rick, that's me. Maybe you need to come back. Maybe you're backsliding. Fans, just keep a look online. If somebody raises their hand online, just give me a thumbs up. Come on, as I look to the left and to the right. All right, well, man, we're going to say a prayer together. And it's not just about a prayer. I know there's a lot of speculation, a lot of stuff out there. All you just say is simple prayer. It's not a simple prayer. And see, this prayer isn't to me. It's to Jesus himself. We stand firm on the word of God. And so can we all join in with this incredible woman in praying and just repeat after me, ma'am. Okay, say, dear Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. And I know I need a savior. Lord, I turn from my wicked ways. I confess you as Lord. I believe in my heart that you rose from the dead. Come into me, change me, transform me. I give you my life now. In the mighty and precious name of Jesus Christ. Come on, in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, come on, can we give this incredible woman a round of applause? Thank you, ma'am. We have a leader that's gonna come and chat with you right now. Come on, someone just gave their heart to Christ. It says that the angels in heaven rejoice.